Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you that you're constantly calling us up to the high standard. We all recognize we're not where we could be. We're not where we should be. But you love us. You never leave us. You keep pulling at our heart. Help us, Lord, to see how important it is to take the time to make the effort to really let you have our affections. Bless us now as we look at this last portion of what we've been studying. And may we understand, may we be equipped to help someone else in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I don't know if you remember how we started. It's been a while now. <laughs> you remember we started talking about the fall. What happened in the fall? Man was cut off from the main computer. And so man was adrift, not hooked up anymore. And we centered on just three elements. His intelligence, his emotions, and his will. Okay. Could you go back there? Remember some of that now? <laughs> now, his intelligence, you remember, since it wasn't hooked up to God anymore, the only thing he could know was what was right in front of him. He became a materialist. And then his emotions didn't go away. He still had his emotions. But now since he doesn't have God to hook those emotions to, he's got to find something else. And everything he finds to attach his emotions to wounds him. See? And so he's got bad intelligence, worse emotions, and he's got to use those now to decide things. His will. <laughs> and with bad intelligence and a messed up emotion, what kind of decisions are you going to make? <laughs> See? And he's got to be a master of something. His will says, I want to be a master of something. He can't even be a master of himself. But he wants to be the master of something. So he just he starts his emotions, he tears them all up, and he decides, I'm going to be the master of something. <laughs> he takes it out on his wife. Yeah. He kicks his dog. <laughs> if he's a boss, oh, he's a boss. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> so this whole world's gone haywire because of all that. There's a real reason for all the messes. We've been cut off from God. So now, having been reminded, the calamity was great. And God had a problem. Was his answer sufficient? Was his answer perfect? <laughs> well, let's look at that today. We want to see what is the result of what God set out to do? What are the results? The initial work of grace is described for us by Jesus. He said there are three things that have to happen. A person must understand about sin. Now, we have our little pet things that we say, and they're true. But after, after you have said them 4,225 times, 
They don't mean anything anymore. You just say them. <laughs> See? And we can spot it out. Sin is the transgression of the law. <laughs> okay, we said it. Now, do we know what it means? <laughs> what law? The Word of God. Well, that's a mighty big law, isn't it? It goes from Genesis to Revelation 22. That's what sin is. Oh, I thought it was just Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, Ten Commandments is enough, don't you think? <laughs> How many of us are doing those perfectly? Every day, all the time. <laughs> and there's a whole Bible to look at. <laughs> so sin. The Spirit of God has to show us what sin is. Sin is the rejection of God. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how small you go, it's still a rejection. See? Two, the Spirit of God has to convince us about righteousness. And you know, it seems to me, it takes a lot of convincing. How many of us right now, don't raise your hand, how many of us right now believe in righteousness? <laughs> now, I did not say righteousness by faith. That's something else. That is not righteousness, I'm sorry. That's disobedience by faith. Because I have faith, I can disobey. I'm going to get covered. I said that to 125 people Thursday night. And I think I confused a lot of people. Yeah. But they need to be confused. Do you know that? We all need to be confused so we start thinking about things. <laughs> Righteousness. What is righteousness? Right doing. Right doing. Don't get fancy. <laughs> right doing. That's all. So, sin, righteousness. And the third thing, judgment. What is judgment all about? Paul was in front of an unbeliever one time talking. And he got over into judgment. And that person says, Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, You're really an interesting fella. I'd like to hear more sometime. I'll call for you. <laughs> Guess what his knees were doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was trembling. Ask yourself, when's the last time I trembled when I thought about judgment? That man was smart enough to tremble. <laughs> yeah, he understood something. I think the Spirit of God got to him and told him what judgment is. That's kind of serious. That's what it is. There's something about a penalty we tend to forget about. Penalty is for rebellion. There's going to be a comeuppance. It's going to happen. It's going to come. It cannot be avoided. If we don't have Jesus Christ, you know, I have tried to think about it myself. Understanding some of these things on a very basic level I've tried to understand what would happen if I was on the wrong side of the fence on that day. Oh! It's unbelievable to think about that. Jeremiah, what did he say? The summer is past. The harvest is over. And I'm lost. What a terrible thing to realize.
So those three things have to happen. God has to make us aware of what sin really is, of what righteousness is, and what judgment means. And so, God is busy doing that, showing all of us, all over the world. And when a person understands, now what? Oh! God says, okay, we got the information to you. You have understood it with your head. What are you going to do with it now? The person can never say, I didn't know. I have said that to many a minister in a Sunday keeping church. I have told them, when the judgment day comes, you tell Jesus you did not know. You never heard about this. You try to tell him that. <laughs> well, God's telling us lots of things, too. When a person understands responsibility. Okay? Well, responsibility can go either direction. Refuse what God is sharing. Say, no, the price is too high. Or accept it, receive it by faith, believe, trust. You see, faith without trust is no good. You've all seen that scripture. The devils believe. <laughs> and they, yeah, they tremble too, don't they? The devils believe, but it's not doing them any good because they don't trust God to do what He said. They can't. They're sealed the other direction now. So when a person becomes a Christian, they are now in partnership. And that brings us up to date now. What He did, those seven steps. Let's get to the results now. Let's get to the results. When man is joined to Christ, and I didn't say believe in. That's no good either. Nobody cares what you believe in. <laughs> you know that God is never going to judge your faith? Yeah. There shouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist in the world that believes they're going to be judged by their faith because the Bible doesn't teach it. We're going to be judged by our works. Who gave you the faith? Yeah, God, Jesus, gave you the faith. Why should He try to measure his, what He gave you? Why should He judge how good He is at giving faith? That doesn't make any sense. But he wants to see what's, what happened with the faith he gave you. He wants to see what you did with it. <laughs> He's not going to do that part. He says, I give you the faith. I give you the strength. I give you the spirit. I give you everything to work with. Now do something. <laughs> I was talking to a high-powered evangelist that if I said his name, you'd all know it. I could say that name anywhere in the world. Everybody would know it. We were sitting there talking. I, I was talking. He wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> I wanted to ask him what he believed about perfection. And he went like this. <laughs> he was not going to commit himself to anything. So I was asking questions and talking. And I couldn't hardly get anywhere with it. So he opened his mouth once. He says, I'm saved by faith. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, are you telling me your religion says Jesus does everything? Yep. I said, I think I want to follow you around for a while. Did Jesus 
get out of bed for you this morning? Did Jesus eat breakfast for you this morning? Did Jesus... And he's sitting there starting to get frustrated with me. I said, come on, don't tell me Jesus does everything. If you don't eat, you're going to starve to death. It's simple. Jesus is not going to eat for you. <laughs> and there's lots of things he's not going to do for you. We didn't part on very good terms, I'm sorry to say. I really felt sorry for him. This giant of a man in Seventh-day Adventist circles. When a person is joined to Christ, that's not believing it. Joined. Joined. Connected. That's the word Ellen White uses over and over and over. Connected. Connected. When a person is connected to Jesus, that person is restored to God. That's all there is to it. Restored. So that's what we're going to look at today. What does that mean? To be restored. Well, we all know the beginnings. We use the big fancy word, justification. Justification. That's a legal term. But please remember, it's just a legal term. It's not the full gospel. It's the beginning of our experience with God. Again, justification. This legal term means justice. See? Justice. And justice means law. So the very first thing we're looking at is a person has a problem with law, with government, with God, with purity, with holiness, with all of it. So God has to fix it somehow. But he has a problem, and we know what the problem is. Law cannot be done away with. With, notwithstanding what all the churches are trying to do, law cannot be done away with. If you did away with law, there would be no more government. And how are you going to run anything without a government? So the law cannot be done away with. And so God, in His nature, says the law is eternal because I am eternal and the law is a transcript of my character. So the law is. Well, man has transgressed the law and the law says the penalty for transgression is death, annihilation, oblivion, non-existence. I asked somebody just this week, what is death? And they said, separation from God. <laughs> separation from God. Well, tell me, how far? <laughs> and now their brains are rattling over their dead. Come on, don't bother me with thinking. <laughs> how long? How hot? Oh, <laughs> we need to talk to people like that. We need to ask them things they're not ready to hear and make them wonder, yeah, how come? I said, you know, that, that answer is part right, separation from God. You know, when you're dead, you are really separated. That's true. <laughs> you're good and separated. But that's what happens when you're dead. That doesn't tell you what death is. That's just what happens. Well, I'm not going to go through that whole thing. <laughs> this meeting starts at three. 
<laughs> These people came from Colorado. They have an excuse. <laughs> I'm sorry you missed the introduction. You may not understand the rest of it now. Uh, so anyhow, God has this problem of maintaining the law and somehow getting the humans back. Now, of course, we're sitting on this side of things. We say, well, I know the answer. But maybe we don't appreciate it enough. He's got to justify a transgressor. Now, it has to be a major problem because even the devil couldn't figure out a solution to that one. He figured he had God. Yeah, if, if he saves that man, he's got to save me too. That's what he was after. <laughs> so, what is God's solution? Well, we know the solution. We're not covering the solution. We're trying to get to the results. What happens as a result of the plan of redemption? That's what we, It takes me a while to get to things. Well, we know the sin had to be canceled somehow. Well, there's only one way to get rid of sin, and that's death. And the death that we have been talking about all these weeks is one of infinite worth. It takes an infinite value to take care of one sin. So we can't begin to imagine what it takes to care, take care of the whole sin problem. But God has an infinity to work with and He created an infinite infinite value in the death of Jesus. A perfect, perfect value of life and death. So now, let's begin moving towards our subject today. I think most of us are here now, so we can zero in. Romans, the third chapter. You all know this verse. We have to start with verse 24 so we're understanding here. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. So there is the only solution there will ever be in the plan of salvation. Jesus has paid every penalty that can be imagined, anything that could ever come up, and God says it's all taken care of now. I can justify you based on what Jesus has done. End of story. Now, the point I would like to begin making here is that Jesus imputes this life to us. That's the legal problem. That takes care of us legally, but that's not salvation. A lot of people think they can say they're saved because Jesus has imputed His righteousness to them. No, that's just forgiveness. Forgiveness is not enough. You know, I don't know if I've ever said that to this group. Forgiveness is not enough for salvation. If forgiveness was enough, how come we're not in heaven? Are you forgiven, Ken? Sure. Why aren't you in heaven? If, you're, if that's all it takes to go to heaven is to be forgiven, how come you're not in heaven? You have a reason? <laughs> Anybody? You're not there because you're not safe to save yet. Forgiveness is not enough. God has a plan, and that's what we're looking at today. 
Redemption has results. And God has to show those to the universe. Let's think about this for a moment. The guilt has been canceled. Every exclusion that kept us from, from God has been removed. Do you sense that today? Do you know it right now that there are no barriers between you and the Father because of what Jesus has done? None! You don't need to beg God for anything. You are children according to the birthright that Jesus has given us. You can go to God's refrigerator anytime you want, open the door, take out something and munch on it. It's your refrigerator. The angels cannot do that. <laughs> it's not their refrigerator, but it's your refrigerator. <laughs> okay? Children don't ask. It's their house. <laughs> We've got to get a hold of this. We have a right. Maybe we'll talk some more about that. So, let's start moving now. The restoration to God by virtue of that connection with Jesus, that union, is more than imputation. It's not just a thing he writes in a book. Connection is a real living thing where he imparts, that's another fancy word, he gives his life as a gift to you as a redeemed person. So now you have the life of Jesus. Well, so far we haven't said anything unusual. <laughs> Everybody knows these things up to about here. But I want you to think what that means. When Jesus comes to us, and please don't give me the theological things about whatever. It's Him that comes. He Himself. You don't need to know how He does it. He said He comes to us. So, a new life comes to us. His human life? He's a human in heaven, isn't he? We discussed this a little bit. He is limited in time and space because of his humanity. But he's not just a human, is he? He is God, I am, which is limitless. God can be any place He wants, any time He wants. The fact that He has a human form is no limitation to God. You cannot separate out the human and the Godhead and say, there's two people, there's only one person. Human, divine, one person. So, when Jesus imparts His life to you, What are you getting? You're getting the human life and He is giving you His divine life. You are being joined in redemption to God Himself. That's why nobody cares what you believe. That means nothing. We want to know what's happening. For real? We have been joined to God Himself. And if that's not an awesome thought to you, I think you ought to go home about now. We have a new union with God. And it's more than Adam would have had if he had never sinned. Yeah, we'll talk about that some more. <laughs> Amazing. 
Christ Object Lessons 333. You all know this quote. We're losing people already. <laughs> 333. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. You should have that one underlined in your book. If you don't, you better get it done and memorize it and then figure out what it means. Little old me has the will of man cooperates with the will of God. It becomes omnipotent. Who, me? No, you with God. <laughs> He's bringing the omnipotence. <laughs> but he never leaves it out. He never leaves it out. What Jesus is, he has brought to me. He brought me his life. I now have his life, his omnipotent life. I know we're not used to thinking about things like this. I know it. I talked to too many Seventh-day Adventists. All of them with their, not all, but many with their faces hanging down. Oh, I'm never going to make it. Well, no, you're not with that kind of an attitude. Lips hanging down saying, oh, I did it again. Who cares? You're looking in the wrong direction. There is no overcoming at looking at self. There's no such thing. That's one of the worst things we can do is keep looking at all of our failures. You know, there are laws in God's universe. He says you become what you behold. In beholding, you are changed. If you're going to be looking at Jesus all the time, that's what you're going to become like. You keep looking at yourself, guess what? Oh, what a problem that is. See? You know what that is? Oh, poor pity pat me. What that really is, is pride. I'm such a magnificent sinner. God can't change me. Yeah, he can move the world. He can do all of that. But he can't do me. I'm too big. <laughs> I'm too bad. <laughs> Come on. We need to get off of that stuff. We have His life, human and divine. What did I do with the books? The books are gone. Here we go. Sons and Daughters, page 291. I am the vine, said Christ. You are the branches. Do you know what a vine looks like and what a branch looks like? These are not just words. <laughs> this is a reality. And if, if we don't know the things that God talks about in the Bible and in the Spirit of Prophecy, we ought to go find a place to look at them and see what, how they work. Sheep. Do you know anything about sheep? I do. Grew up with several Here's a statement for you. A lost sheep has never gone looking for the shepherd. That's right. <laughs> do you know that? Do you know that? A lost sheep never goes looking for the shepherd. And by the way, that's in the spirit of prophecy and it says it just that way. What has to happen? The shepherd has to go looking for the sheep. That's the only way anything happens. Why do you suppose people are not knocking at your door saying, please give me Bible studies? Is that what you're waiting for? 
Yeah, you're waiting for 15 people to walk up your street and say, Oh boy, I've been waiting for Bible studies. Here he is. Give me Bible studies. They're lost sheep. <laughs> they don't go looking. You have to go looking for them. That's why Jesus said, go. He didn't say, wait. Go. And by the way, that was not a suggestion. That was a command. Are we obeying Jesus Christ? Oh, I keep the Sabbath. That isn't what I asked. Are we obeying Jesus? He said, go. You work that one out. Page 291. I am the vine, said Christ. You are the branches. The closest possible connection is here represented. And graft the leafless twig upon the flourishing vine stalk. It becomes a living branch, drawing sap and nourishment from the vine. Fiber by fiber. Are you getting that picture? Fiber by fiber. Vein by vein. The sapling clings until it buds and blossoms and bears fruit. Bud, blossom, and fruit. Where have I heard that someplace? <laughs> the, the candlestick, sure. What kind of buds, blossoms, and fruit? Almonds. almonds. What does the word almonds mean in Hebrew? Shakad. Almond means to hasten. Why are we budding, blossoming, and fruiting? To hasten the coming of Jesus. How do we hasten the coming of Jesus? Bring people in. Bring people in so He can come. Develop a character like His. So fiber by fiber, vein by vein, the sapling clings to the bud, blossoms, and bears fruit. The sapless twig represents the sinner. When united to Christ, now listen carefully. When united to Christ, soul is joined to soul. Now I have to tell you, when I first read that one, I about fell down. <laughs> what? The soul of Jesus? It's joined to my soul. There's nothing in that statement about believing anything. There's nothing in that statement about faith. There's nothing in that statement about what church you belong to. There's nothing in that statement about going to church on Sabbath or eating peanut butter. All of this, everything in Christianity that's real, is in this sentence, soul, the soul of Jesus is joined to my soul. Now, what in the world else do I need? You see, we keep playing tiddlywinks instead of getting to the real thing. This is all we need. This one thing. That's why we've been going through the seven steps. It's to get us to understand, what did he do that for? Well, here it is. We're starting to touch it now. Soul is joined to soul. The feeble, the finite, to the holy and infinite. And man becomes one with Christ. There's a lot more on that page. Go dig it out sometime. Man becomes one with Christ. Philippians 4.13 
Now you can quote this one, but I don't want you to quote it. I want you to step into it. Step into it and just go where it goes. I can do all things. <laughs> there it is. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Come on, go home today and say it. Go stand in the middle of your front room and say it. I can do all things through Christ. <laughs> and mean it. Say it. Mean it. And now the devil heard you. <laughs> yeah. And the devil's going to start shaking. You know that? So, uh-oh, somebody's getting this. <laughs> I can do all things through Jesus. Why? Because He's in me now. Not just the human Jesus, but God Himself, Jesus, is in me. Colossians 1.19. It's just over the page there. It pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. All fullness? What does that mean when you say God has all fullness? <laughs> Well, there's, there's nothing extra. There's nothing outside of it. That's it. All fullness is in Jesus. There's nothing more. Chapter 2, verse 9. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in human form, there's nothing of God left out of him. All the fullness. Now, read verse 10. You, Syed, Don, Daryl, Ken, Dick, put your name in the verse. Yeah, put your name in it. You, are complete in Him. How complete is that? <laughs> the fullness of God is what God gives us. The fullness of God. Oh, I can't do it. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm so weak. Well, why don't you ask the right question? Did God make me that way? <laughs> no, you know He didn't. If we have stupid disabilities, we did it to ourselves. It's our own choices. God doesn't want us that way. He has not made us that way. He has made every provision so that we shouldn't be that way, that we need not be that way. We need to tell the devil to go take a trip <laughs> because he's the only one telling us all those lies. Now, I'm not going to camp on you because I have the same problems you do, okay? I'm a human. I understand. I'm fighting the same battles. But I want to tell you something. I'm starting to learn some things. You get on the devil's ground and he's going to get you. He's going to do it. Because the habits are a strong thing. The trick is to start getting off of his ground. Get off of it. You don't need it. God's not telling you to do something 
strange and terrible to tempt yourself. He's never told you to do that. If there's a certain kind of book you're looking at that's not good for you, get rid of it. <laughs> What's the big deal? You're going to hang on to a book and say, I, I can't go to heaven because I'm too weak. Well, you won't be so weak when you get rid of that book. Yeah. Now, you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't do that. We just went through justification. But you can sure do something to get yourself out of heaven. Yes. Your works can get you out of heaven real easy. You have to decide whose side you're on in all of this. It says that desire of ages. When the devil says you can't keep the law. Yeah, it's page 308, I think. And you say, yeah, that's right, I can't keep the law. She said, you're just seconding the devil. Whose side are you on? <laughs> it seems to me Christians ought to be on God's side. <laughs> All right, you are complete in Him. So what has happened here? The human who has been restored to God now has God living inside, not just a human, Jesus, God, I am living inside. So what we have here, are you ready? A new form of God. Yeah. You think about that for a minute. We are not God. We will never be God. But if God is in us, He's really there. This is a new form of God by which He can express Himself to the universe. Haven't you seen it? Don't you know? You are the temple of God. Are those just words? Do we just say them? And we say that's part of the health message? <laughs> Come on! You can only be a temple of God if He's living in there. We are a new form of God to express to the universe. Maybe we need to look at that a little bit. Christ is the head, right? What are we supposed to be? <laughs> well, if He's the head, we're the body. Aren't we as much Christ as He is walking around? He says, I am not going to walk around without limbs. <laughs> this is the new manifestation of God in the universe. Jesus, the head, and His body. connected. <laughs> this is not a metaphor. This is a reality. The saints are His body so that the Father may show the new form of God, Jesus, and all His people to all the universe forever. Have you ever read the statement? Restore the image of God in man. Maybe we read that too carefully. We say restore the image. The shadow of God in man. I'm just a shadow. No, 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 no. We're missing it. We have God living in us. We're not just a shadow. To restore the image of God in man means the likeness. I walk like God now when all of this comes to fruition. When the harvest comes. You see, part of the problem is Seventh-day Adventists learning these things think it's got to be today at, tr at 3 o'clock. You're not going to be the likeness of God at 3 o'clock. I'm sorry. 
This is not going to happen until he finishes the plan of redemption, that he completes it, he perfects it, and you are what he claimed you were. We have some growing to do. We have some learning to do. We have a lot of struggling to do. But we've got to believe these things or we're not going anywhere. That's where we're headed. They will follow Him wheresoever He goes. They can't do anything else. <laughs> where He goes, they go. God expresses Himself in man in the completed plan of redemption. I think we've been missing what Ellen White has been trying to tell us about character development. <laughs> yeah. Let's try to zero in on it in the moments that are left here. First John chapter 3. We know all these verses. First John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. See, nobody knows that yet. We know we're the sons of God. You better know that. But it says, we, we, we can't think of what He has in store for us. It's way beyond us right now. We just don't know that part of it. But notice what it says. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. <laughs> now, is that true or isn't it? You mean I'm going to be like Jesus? That's what it says. Now, we can't think that high yet. That's what he just says. It does not yet appear. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to us. But he said, but we do know because God has promised when he comes, we're going to be like him. Now, is that high enough? <laughs> yeah. Do you believe it? Oh, not me. Come on. The smallest little child that knows so little is going to be there that believes and trusts. And you know, it's easier for them than some of us. Yeah. There was a little girl in the old days when they didn't have telephones and all that stuff. Old-fashioned boats. Her father would leave for months. She hardly got to know him. But every now and then he'd come home. But she was still little. He came home. And after the hugs and all that, he says, I have something for you. <laughs> she said, oh, oh, Daddy, what do you have? I have an orange for you from a very exotic place. I have an orange for you. And she jumped up. She went running around the house. Oh, I have an orange. I have an orange. I have an orange. He hadn't even shown it to her yet. <laughs> That's what Jesus wants out of us. He says, I have this for you. And you go around telling everybody, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> You're supposed to believe your father. You're supposed to believe Jesus. When he tells you something, rejoice. <laughs> We know. All right, we've covered this part of it. Conduct. 
is always an expression of character. Every now and then people come to me and ask me about their character. They say, how can I know I'm developing a proper character? How do I know I really believe? I just tell them something very simple. I tell them, well, just look at what you're doing. That's who you are. <laughs> it's simple, isn't it? Because what you do is what you believe. If you believe in righteousness, you will do righteousness. If you believe in sin, you will do sin. It all depends on what you believe in. So when we receive Jesus, we have the imparted life. We have the new nature. We have God Himself. And now we're learning to cooperate. Not to be saved, please. People get over there, that's what they think they're doing. I'm cooperating so I can endure and be saved. No! What we're starting to learn is that we are cooperating with infinite energies. Can you get your, your brain around that a little bit? We're learning to cooperate with the infinite energies that cannot fail. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm tempted to start quoting Spirit of Prophecy statements where she says all these things. We don't have time today. But all of this is in the Spirit of Prophecy. She knew things. She didn't know how to get it across to people because we don't read as spiritually as we should. We read with the brain instead of with the heart that God gives us to understand. We need to slow down. All right. The intelligence now has new understanding. And the infinite is now seen again. I see what God sees. I'm connected. Yeah. No longer a materialist. Now I understand spiritual values. I understand what God knows with my capacity. And that restlessness I used to have, always wanting to know things. The limitation of being a human who can't see past my nose ceases. No more restlessness. Because now I have truth. I have Jesus. And I know everything He wants me to know at the right time. I have peace. What about my emotions? <laughs> oh, the degradation is gone. It's God. No more me, me, me. Every relationship that I can have in this world now is conditioned by love for God. That's first. That's highest. That's always. And now, my interest in others is to help them. That's all. Not to use them. Not to exploit them. Not to get something. To help them. The will. No longer on a false basis. My intelligence is working now. My emotion is working. So what is my will now? To do His will. <laughs> to do His will. That's my joy. That's my pleasure. Not, oh, do I have to give that up? Come on. <laughs> I'm going to miss heaven for a piece of cheese. <laughs> I picked that one because that's the Adventist poison. Yeah, we think we're okay with cheese. No, cigarettes and cheese is the same thing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's as far as I'll go today. <laughs> we need to start reading our books. Yes. 
We need to start saying, God, what do you want me to know? What, how do you want me to live? So I can express you before the universe. I'm your new form. I'm learning. <laughs> Haven't we talked about the glory of God here? Every moral action has the glory of God as its end. You know, when I first learned that statement, I sat down and I thought about it. How many of my actions are not moral? <laughs> yeah. That's the first question that came to me. If every moral action has the glory of God as its end, how many of those am I doing? How come all of them aren't that way? <laughs> We're trying to live in two different worlds, unfortunately. We have been taught to do that by well-meaning people. It's called righteousness by faith. I'm sorry. No. That's going to drag you down. You better start being righteous. Yeah. If you have faith, Jesus will see you do it. But don't think you can be righteous by faith and go to heaven and that's all there is. It's not going to happen. Philippians 4.8 I'm going to sneak this one in right here and you deal with it. <laughs> Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I think it might be well for us to type it or write it down or something. On a little piece of paper. And as we wander around through our day, when we settle down to do something, pull it out. <laughs> and say, does what I'm about to do meet all of this? <laughs> I have an idea that if that's sitting there, and we're looking at it, and we know God knows we're looking at it, <laughs> we might not turn that page. We might not flick the switch. We might not lots of things. Man, like God. Think of it. Man, like God. So Jesus, in the plan of redemption, accomplished now, has brought the whole human race that will believe. Each one contributing to the outshining of the fullness of deity. God is using every individual Christian as a means to show who He is. Now let's go back for a moment. The original divine intention. What was it for man? He had Adam. He had Eve. They were pure. They didn't have a character yet, but they were working on it. What was His intention? That they be pure human beings, holy, beautiful human beings. <laughs> That's the first man. Man was to be the image of God, but in a very limited sense. But even above what the angels were. But I want you to notice something. God did not have in mind to save the species. It never was his plan to save a species. That's evolution. <laughs> See? That is 
critical to your understanding of your relationship with Jesus and the Father. God is not saving the human race for the sake of saving the human race. The plan of redemption is about the individual. And not only the individual, but the weakest ones. God's plan of salvation is to save the weakest ones. Now, I don't think we have any of those in here today, but if there were, <laughs> we're covered, see? We're covered. The weakest ones. That's our responsibility as Christians, to be looking for the weakest ones to help us. Because this world keeps smashing them down. What? You only make a hundred dollars a month and you can barely eat. You can't survive. You don't have any medicines. Nobody will help you. You're getting too much. We're going to cut your appropriation down 50%. You know that's happening right now. It's our job as Christians to say, no, you're not going down. We can do something to help. We can get several people to help. We can do lots of things here. You're not going to go down. God doesn't want the weak ones going down. The individual. Have you figured out yet why all societies have failed? There are no perfect individuals. <laughs> There's nothing to hold it together. <laughs> but God is creating the perfect society because no one will be there who is not a perfect individual in Jesus Christ. These are theories of society you will not read in the books. It's only in the Bible. So Jesus redeems the individual. And the real individuals in Jesus form the society called the church. There is a solidarity now of individuals. But the terrible thing is that people who have big churches say, we're the church and you join us. Right. No. Right. No. <laughs> I'm the church. <laughs> That's an organization. Forget that. Right. That organization is not going to go to heaven. I'm sorry. Right. I told that to one of our ministers recently, and he got a little bit excited. Mm -hmm. he, said, he said, oh, you're walking a fine line. I said, no, I'm not. It's clear to me. <laughs> the organization's not going through. He says, where did you find that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, that doesn't mean that. I said, what are you saying? You believe in the spirit of prophecy, don't you? He said, yeah. Well, stop believing. That's what it says. You know, we play games. <laughs> we can't afford games. God tells us plainly something, anything. And if you say, yeah, but to God, <laughs> don't do it the church not the system not the organization one life one life one light one, li one obedience one love. Each individual perfectly answering the divine ideal. Revealing who God is. Yeah. That's who we are. Revealing who God is. So the ultimate victory of redemption. Christ 
is completed. He's not complete without us. He is completed in a whole race united as His body becoming His medium of expression to the universe. <laughs> That's who we are. That's why we can't do without each other. We're brothers and sisters. We are membranes of the body. <laughs> you cannot love Jesus and not love the brethren. You can't do it. So when people go around arguing with each other and being critics and tearing things up and saying, oh, they're Babylon, or oh, the leaders do this, or oh, those people are really making a lot of confessions. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to be too proud to have everybody understand what that means one of these days. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Let's finish. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. There, Paul said it. One body, that's all. Jesus. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. It doesn't say perfect men. One perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's the perfect man. The man is Jesus. That's why people don't go to heaven one at a time. You can't make that perfect man one at a time like that going to heaven. Jesus has to come for all of them at the same time. One body. That's what it says in Galatians, doesn't it? Not of seeds as of many, but one seed, which is Christ. The plan of salvation was never about saving humans as the sand of the sea. It was about saving Jesus and then getting all his membranes together. <laughs> so it is an accomplished fact all that Jesus means to do for the rest of eternity will be with his perfected body all living his sacred life as his limbs so let's finish we're talking now more than victory this is something the devil never thought about. All of this was way beyond him. He had no idea what God was going to do. He couldn't imagine it with that superior brain. It was too radical. Victory. Yeah, he could understand victory, but not this kind of a victory. What kind of a victory are we talking about? We're talking about a victory that was gained over the original failure. It's just not victory. Look at what man lost. Look what he became. And God steps in with the plan of redemption and look what he got out of it. <laughs> out of the awful results of sin. And none of us here understand how terrible sin really is. We're too comfortable. Yeah, we can go to the store and buy food. Do you know in Africa, right now, this minute, 30,000 children die every day. Every day, I said. Because they can't get any food. That's just the little children. We have no idea all the atrocities that are going on all over the world. Millions and millions of terrible, horrible things that God has to look at. Sin is something miserable and terrible. We have no idea. And out of that terrible, awful disaster, God made something infinitely greater 
than Adam and Eve perfected. <laughs> Out of the dead, He made a new creation. A new creation. We see the wonders of grace. God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ the human. Christ, God, man, with the fullness of the Godhead in you. Revelation, chapter 1. This is it. Are you ready for the song? Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests Unto God and His Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing that song. He's made us kings and priests. Let's start doing it now. Yeah. Anybody we run across, I'm a child of the king. You don't need to say it. You just think it right in front of them. I'm a child of the king. I have some news for you. <laughs> yeah. Jesus is coming. Let's start listening. He's coming. I know some have been here 50, 60 years saying, oh yeah, I heard that before. Come on now. Is it closer right now than it was when you first heard it? <laughs> yeah. Well, get with the program. It's closer now. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, what a sound that is. Father, not make believe, not hope, not pretend, not anything but reality. Father, you made us, you redeemed us. We're at this side of the cross. Help us to focus every day, to hear your voice every day, to make our choices every day, to glorify your name. To learn more and more what it means to be a child of the King. Help us, Lord, to be constantly available to help someone, whether materially or in the Spirit, but to always be ready and available and to yearn for the souls around us. We thank you that though we in ourselves do not have all the capacities, that all heaven is at our command. And all we need to do is ask. And all the angels that are necessary will be there to help us. We thank you that your spirit is always with us also. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.